We don't want to just have faith, right? We want to do faith, and we want to know what doing faith gets us. For instance, what does faith get you when you're tired?
presence is all I need, it's all I want, it's all I seek, and without it, without it, there's no meaning. Your presence is the air I breathe, the song I sing, and the love I need, and without it. Without it, I'm not living. Oh, your presence, God, your presence is all I need. It's all I want, it's all I seek, and without it, without it, there's no meaning. Your presence is the air I breathe, the song I sing, the love I need, and without it, without it. Good morning. I'm going to open us up in prayer. God, we thank you for everyone who's watching in this moment. And I pray this morning or evening, wherever you are, that faith would rise up. God, that you would speak to the places where we need faith, where we need to have courage to step into things, 
Lord, we're people of faith, or maybe we're exploring faith. We just pray that you'd breathe on faith and you deposit it in us because you say that it's a gift from you. We pray for uncommon courage in this time with all the tumultuous things we're facing. We pray for uncommon courage with all the blessings you're pouring out. We just trust you, God. We lean in and we say, do what only you can do. That's where faith lives. When you come in, we just thank you that you're such a good father. You're such a powerful redeemer. We thank you, Jesus, for taking care of all the things we've done with your blood. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you come in and you dwell with us. We just love you, God, and we ask that you breathe on this recording. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Whether you're joining us here locally in Hawaii or abroad, we just thank you for, for being here, and we hope this service is a blessing to you. We're gonna continue with our worship with our tithes and our offerings, and you can give online uh, through all the many venues of our um, of ways of doing so. Um, uh, please give only if really you see Blue Water as your home church or you've been blessed by it for a long time. If you're here visiting us or anything of that sort, please don't feel any obligation to give, right? We just hope today's service is a blessing to you. So let me tell you what's going on in the next couple of weeks. This Sunday is our next Sunday Fun Day led by our pastor Rollo Bright, so yes. And uh, we're gonna have a lot of fun gathering together as families if you feel safe and, and wise to do so. And so this Sunday, we're gonna be in beautiful Waikiki at Kaimana Beach Park. And it'll happen this time at 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So feel free to come and do that, bring your family, or even if you, if you wanna come on your own, feel free to do so as well. So if you are interested and you wanna have more questions, email Rolo, okay? We are now beginning a new sermon series. And so, and the sermon series really, um, really talks about, really actually addresses this question. What does faith get you in different circumstances? The late preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, little faith will bring your souls to heaven, but great faith will bring heaven to you. So let's open our hearts, open our Bibles, and just tune our hearts and our ears to Pastor Jordan as he shares and begins this new sermon series. Hello, everybody. Nice to be back with you after a few weeks off. I really want to thank uh, the rest of the staff, particularly for covering, covering for me uh, over the last few weeks. I needed a break. Uh, as most of you know, a few months ago, uh, my beloved grandmother died. And then a few weeks ago, uh, my, my mother died. Uh, and it's getting a little strung out. And uh, as usual, the community has rallied around the Sang family and, and uh, helped us get through it. Um, thanks to all of you who have sent sympathy cards and gifts and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, I, I certainly don't feel alone. I feel bereft, um, but, but well-loved, and I appreciate that. Uh, we are starting a, a new sermon series this week, and, and the series is called, What Does Faith Get You? And the idea is that, uh, it's, what does faith get you when... Blank. And then we're going to talk about various situations in life uh, that faith would help you navigate if you do uh, the proper faith response uh, to them. Uh, the idea is for us to, to meditate on what a healthy faith person does uh, in, in given situations. What's, what's the proper faith response when you're feeling poor or when you're feeling wealthy? or when you're feeling lonely, or when you're just inundated with too many people, uh, when you're feeling lost in life, or when you have so many opportunities, uh, you can hardly choose uh, among them. Uh, what do you do when you feel strong? What do you do when you feel weak? What do you do when you feel angry? Or on those occasions when you feel oddly content. Uh, and, and the occasion for doing this sermon series uh, right now is that uh, I, I don't think in the normal course of life these days, uh, we're being given models of healthy responses to anything right now. I don't know if you've noticed, but the world is in a particularly tough situation right now, generally speaking. 
And it seems to me that right now the world has gone particularly insane. Maybe that's just me, but well, it's, it's just a crazy time. It, it seems to me, I don't mean to be too cynical, but it seems to me like there are a lot of fools in charge of things uh, these days and fools being glorified everywhere you know, in, in politics or in news media or entertainment media. And, and the aggregate sum of all of that foolishness begins to weigh on a spirit. It seeps into one's consciousness a little bit, I think. I don't even think these days that people are, well, people are upset, but I'm not sure they're necessarily in touch uh, with what's really wrong uh, right now in the world, let alone with what could make things right. I think there's a, a void of wisdom um, that I'm seeing more and more. It's just me. But rather than fixate on all the things that are wrong in our world, most of the time, I mean, almost always, it's better to fixate on what health would look like in the world. It's best to fixate on what the goal would be, the strength response, the health response, the faith response, and to get that clear in, in one's mind. What would the right thing be in this given situation? That's something that every person of faith should be able to answer. We need a firm vision for what faith in an all-powerful, loving God looks like for us no matter what the situation is. And that's a manner of thinking in which we should be fluent. Uh, and then we can apply that vision, that faith vision, as a template that helps us to behave strongly and healthfully uh, in our lives. Following so far? So that's kind of what the sermon series is for. It's sort of a meditation on proper and healthy faith responses to any number of given situations. You'll notice that Jesus, in his ministry, if you read the Gospels, never discussed people's problems with them. He didn't do that. Instead, he only ever pointed to solutions for them. He, he didn't spend a lot of time criticizing. He didn't spend a lot of time diagnosing the negativities. Instead, he just spent his time manifesting what true health looks like, what true life looks like, right? He modeled and he made it happen right before their eyes. And having seen Jesus's model for solution, people could implicitly understand what the problem was, could implicitly could implicitly understand what was wrong with them and what was wrong in the world around them. Now, some people responded well to that understanding and some people responded not so well to that understanding, but I think everybody was able to see it. So in this sermon series, you know, let's remember first that we are supposed to live in Jesus' faith over and against and through whatever situation we face in life. And then let us consider what faith gets us when we feel empowered or disempowered, when we feel strong or weak, rich or poor, certain or confused, full of praise or full of complaints, whatever the case might be. And today what I want to talk about is what faith gets us when we're tired. What does faith get us when we're feeling really tired? Anybody feeling tired these days? tired with the situation, maybe tired with your life, maybe just tired generally. Uh, these days in my life, I got to be honest with you, I'm feeling a little tired. Uh, and some of you know some of the major situations that have me feeling uh, a little uh, strung out these days. I wouldn't say that I feel tired. I would honestly say I just feel obliterated. And in truth, um, I've had some interesting seasons in my life, but I would say that this season is by far the toughest time that I've ever gone through in my 54 years. I know. I don't look that old, but I'm a vegan quack. I'm just saying. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just, you know, lower than low. I would go so far as to say that I, I'm not particularly functional right now, right? I ever have one of those seasons where you feel like you're getting through the days with half your brain, maybe, 
no insults from you, Nick. Um, I have I have this I have this crackpot theory about how we experience traumas and how they affect us. Let's, let's call it Jordan's crackpot theory number 183, because I have a lot of crackpot theories. And my crackpot theory is that often in life, what destroys us is not like a severe trauma. Uh, what destroys people oftentimes in life is the variety of traumas that they face, right? If, if, if one bad thing happens to you, you can almost always make adjustments, even if it's a terrible thing. You know, even if you've lost somebody you love or you have a terrible health crisis or you, you become limited in some fashion or something uh, really bad happens to you, you get attacked or, or abused. I mean, some very bad things can happen. If it's just the one thing and if it's a fairly brief thing, a healthy person with good faith and support can almost always uh, come through. We are naturally a resilient people. Um, but what gets us into trouble is when like six things go wrong at the same time, or there's this cascade of trouble, or traumas last over a long period of time, and then we get worn down, don't we? So when you have a health crisis that causes economic crisis, that causes a relational crisis, and then a few other bad situation happens and somebody betrays you and all of a sudden you like eight or ten different things that you're trying to juggle in life that's very fatiguing, uh, that can be uh, devastating. So breadth of trauma um, is often an indicator of trouble for people. And I just share that and just share that observation in case there's somebody out there that relates to it right now. You know, you feel like, wow, oh, there's just... It's just a variety of things uh, that I'm trying to deal with. The variety of setbacks that have me feeling kind of numb, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that's you. And so in the spirit of variety of troubles and variety of, of challenges, I'm feeling, I'm, I'm feeling pretty stinking low. Uh, I won't lie about it. Probably the lowest I've ever felt. But I have been close in the past. Uh, those of you who have been following Blue Water Sermons for a long time know that I uh, have periodically struggled with depression in my life. And uh, one of the worst times was when I was a grad student um, at the University of Chicago uh, back in the day. This would be uh, in, in the 90s. And I was terribly depressed for a number of reasons. No need to go through them. But I decided that what I wanted to do was just attack the problem uh, uh, dead on. And so I developed uh, over some weeks four rules for handling depression, uh, for navigating depression. And I've talked about these rules before, so forgive me if I'm repeating them to you. But rule number one was don't panic. It will be better in the morning because I would go through these periods of panic in which I did hurtful things. Uh, and number two was exercise and eat right because, you know, we're physical people and we got to take care of ourselves even when we feel very poorly. Number three was make hay while the sun shines, which is an old country phrase. What it means is when the sun is shining, harvest your hay because tomorrow it might rain. And if you harvest hay on a rainy day, it molds and mildews and you ruin your crop. So if you're feeling half decent on a given afternoon, even though you're generally depressed, do work while you feel half decent. And some, sometime soon thereafter, you're not gonna feel decent and you're not gonna be able to work. So get in the habit of making the most of your good moments. Keeps you moving forward. That was a healthy rule. Rule number four though was remember the Sabbath. It's the law, stupid. And that's how I expressed it to myself, right? The Sabbath is this, uh, this biblical custom uh, God commanded his people to take one day a week and just rest, just chill out and, and worship the Lord and, and worship together and just enjoy. That's a commandment to rest regularly. And I had to throw in this phrase, it's the law, stupid, because sometimes I'm not smart enough to do what's good for me. Um, and those rules, particularly that Sabbath rule, what it did is that it kept me going when I felt like I couldn't. Uh, those rules helped me to move forward. And that's, that's what I think the Sabbath rule is. That's why I wanted to share uh, that little story from my depressive period. <clears throat> the Sabbath rest 
helps you to keep going <clears throat> even during periods of great fatigue, even during periods of great trauma. Follow me so far? That's what the Sabbath is for. It's that which keeps you going healthfully and strongly in spite of whatever is going down. And I think that phrase keeps you going is the operative phrase in life oftentimes because tiredness is only a problem when you have to keep going. If you have one of those lives where you get to stop out whenever, like you don't have any responsibilities, you don't have any challenges, and when you feel tired, you can just vacation for eight months. Any of you guys have that kind of life? I think I've seen them on TV. Uh, but if you get to just stop whenever you feel tired, then this is not a problem for you. Then you don't have to listen to the rest uh, of the sermon. The trick, of course, is to not just stop life uh, when you feel fatigued or traumatized or stressed. That's the trick. And to not stop, you have to master Sabbath rest in, in, in some fashion. So there are two things that faith gets you when you're tired and you need to keep going. Two things. And this is kind of the point of the sermon. So I want people to remember both of these things, right? Two things that faith gets you when you face a situation of great tiredness but you need to keep going, All right? Here they are. Number one, faith gives you the ability to keep going no matter what. And two, faith gives you the ability to take breaks no matter what. Following? What faith gets you is the ability to keep going in life no matter what, to move forward, to do the positive, and faith gives you ability to take a break, to get a little Sabbath rest, no matter what, no matter what's swirling around you. Clap if you understand. It's the only applause I will get today from these people. Um, let's talk about Jesus a little bit. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit subtle, but when you read the gospel stories, this idea of fatigue and rest is super prevalent. Super prevalent. I would say it's one of the chief topics of the Gospels, though it weaves its way through a lot of other stories, and so it's easy to miss if you're just reading casually. My favorite example of this comes from the middle of the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, Matthew has in it a repetition of stories that we find in Mark and you find in Luke. So all of these stories can be found in a number of Gospels, but I really like the Matthew version of there. I want to summarize for you just two chapters of Matthew, Matthew 14 and 15. You can read through them sometime uh, when you feel like it. But what Matthew 14 and 15 is, is this kind of a, uh, in, in summary, it's, it's a record of a series of things that Jesus does when he is blindingly tired. And it's just really indicative of how to navigate tiresome life when you understand that that's what's going on. So in Matthew 14, it starts out, Jesus loses his cousin. John the Baptist gets killed. And people forget that John the Baptist was actually a cousin of Jesus, knew him for a long time. And, and John the Baptist gets uh, executed by, by Herod under very nefarious, trumped up charges. It's, it's just a nasty situation. Uh, John gets betrayed to death. And so Jesus is in mourning. He's in, he's in grief. That's how the story starts. And what he does instinctively is he takes his friends, the disciples, and he tries to take a little personal retreat with them, which makes all the sense in the world when you're in grief, right? But they can't get away from the crowds because Jesus has become a fairly popular minister at that time and the crowds are following him. And this is when the story of the miraculous feeding takes place because the crowds follow them into the lonely countryside where Jesus is trying to take a break from life. But all hundreds, thousands of people following him. And, and the disciples are like, hey, send away the crowds so you know, they can find something to eat. It's late. And Jesus is like, ah, you give them something to eat. And so he makes something out of nothing. We talked about this miracle a few weeks ago. He has this uber creative moment and he provides for thousands of people out of nothing, right? He makes one lunch into a feast for thousands while being so fatigued he was trying to run away. 
That's basically uh, the story. So he feeds them miraculously. And then what Jesus does is he tries to make an escape across the water, right? At this point, he goes to the shore with his disciples. They get in a boat and they paddle across. They hit a storm along the way. It gets really windy. They get buffeted. But that was Jesus' attempt to cross the lake so that the crowds couldn't follow him, right? Jesus at the beginning of that episode, takes a little introverted time. He sends the disciples away, and then he walks on the water to catch up with them. So he does that miracle. That happens. Along the way, a storm comes. They have the storm tossed boat. You guys probably know that story. So the dude cannot get a break, right? He tries to take a, a break across the water, and a storm hits. You know, sometimes life is like that. He ends up having to do a miracle of walking on water. On the other side, we know from the Mark versions of the story, that's when he encounters the demoniac with the legion of demons. Jesus casts the demons out of them, ends up ruining a herd of pigs. That gets him into a lot of trouble in the countryside. He gets kicked out of that town. Um, but he does you know, encounter a legion of demons and has to uh, fight them while blindingly fatigued. He crosses back to the other side, rowing with the guys. It's a physically exhausting trip on top of everything else. And when he beaches on the other side, he's accosted by a crowd of Pharisees who want to challenge him to public debate. So he has to fight off religious leaders and deal with all of that political nonsense. And then he tries to take a retreat by leaving the country. He goes to Syrophoenicia. He goes outside of the bounds of Israel, the land of Canaan. And that's when the Canaanite mother approaches him and begs him to heal her daughter. And he's like, you know, I can't do that because Father God has sent me to Israel. But, but he encounters faith in the moment. She exhibits a lot of faith. He can't resist it. Ends up uh, casting a demon out of her girl and, and healing the little girl. All of that while he was trying to get a rest. You know, that's the story. Whenever the issue of rest or the Sabbath comes up in the Gospels in the context of Jesus' ministry, it is in the nature of Jesus apparently neglecting to rest uh, or uh, uh, apparently uh, violating the Sabbath customs uh, for rest, even though clearly he's a man of faith and doing great works of faith while he cannot get the rest he needs, right? The first thing we learn about faith and tiredness in the Gospels is that faith enables a person, like Jesus even, to walk through fatigue without stumbling, no matter what one encounters uh, along the way. Jesus walks through blinding fatigue, even though it literally required him to walk on water uh, in this instance even though it required him to do more than one miracle. It literally required him to do the impossible in the Gospels. But as a man of faith, he just did the impossible. It literally required him to fight off a legion of demons in, in the stories. But he did it through faith, even though he was blindingly tired. It literally required him to make something out of nothing, to turn a tiny lunch into a feast for thousands, even though he was blindingly tired. That's what faith gets you in seasons of tiredness, when you just have to go on regardless of what the situation is. Instead of panicking, Jesus did faith. And we often get that choice in life, particularly when we're blindingly tired. I could panic, or I could do something extraordinary in faith. You have to believe in extraordinary things, uh, but presumably if you're listening to this sermon, you do. You should. But that's a real choice that we make. Panic or extraordinary faith. And Jesus models for us extraordinary faith responses at times of extraordinary fatigue and grief. And I, for one, am happy that he does that even if I often fall short of his model. Uh, but that's not to say that Jesus didn't value the Sabbath rest, even though he found, a hard, found it hard to get his Sabbath rest uh, often. Um, 
we can tell that he's valued rest and the Sabbath by virtue of how he went to such great lengths to pursue it, right? It didn't work out for him uh, in this series of stories that, that I have shared. Uh, but you could tell that he was after it, right? That he knew it would be good and, and healthy. In fact, I would say that Jesus' ultimate commentary on what we would consider God's laws or God's commandments comes in the form of a commentary that he made about God's Sabbath commandment, a Sabbath, uh, the, the commandment that we should rest uh, weekly, uh, that we should take a Sabbath. I'm thinking specifically of an interaction he had in Mark chapter 2. Uh, we can read Mark chapter 2, verse 27, uh, for instance. What's happening here is that Jesus and his disciples on the Sabbath are walking through a grain field. And the disciples are hungry, so as they walk, they pick some pieces of grain off of the stalks and they eat them. And Jesus' religious critics see the disciples picking grain off the stalk, and they're like, oh, that's work. That's kind of like harvesting. And you're harvesting on the Sabbath, and that's against God's laws. And so they criticize him, and, and Jesus stops, and, and he says this great one-liner. Maybe some of you know it. He says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, uh, which I think is just a, a potent phrase. What he's saying there is, look, God gives us commandments, like the commandment to rest once a week on, on your Sabbath day. But you have to understand that the reason God makes rules for us is because they're good for us. They help us to do what's good for ourselves, right? You have to understand the reason for the law if you're going to apply the law appropriately. And on a day of rest, my disciples probably shouldn't starve, so I think it's okay if they pick a little grain as they go. I mean, come on, understand the spirit behind the law, right? You get it? And all of God's laws are like that. He doesn't give us laws because he's fussy. He gives us laws because he literally knows what's good for us. And sometimes we don't know what's good for ourselves. So, you know, respect what he says. He's smart and he's caring. Jesus often gets in trouble with the Pharisees for violating the Sabbath because he does good for people on the Sabbath, like he heals them on the Sabbath. And more than once he got in trouble for healing on the Sabbath because the religious leaders thought that healing was like work and you shouldn't work on the Sabbath and all these arguments that he got into. But he saw the Sabbath as a day for being good to people. <clears throat> I think in part because he realized the Sabbath was a day that good, did good for him. You know, all around day of goodness. That's really what the Sabbath should be, uh, which is why the, when I practice the Sabbath during the days of my depression in Chicago, I tried to pretend, that was the word I used, that everything was okay on my Sabbath day. I didn't just take a time out from my work. I didn't just take a time out from my anxiety. I, I tried to pretend that everything was okay in life or that things would be okay soon. And I use that word pretend, not because it's technically accurate, but because it was the way I tricked myself into exercising proper belief, which sometimes to me feels like faking it till I make it, you know? It's like, no, things are okay. Okay, I don't feel like they're okay, but I do feel like there's a God in the universe. Therefore, I choose to trust that they're gonna be okay. That's what I meant, that's what I meant. It's a day full of goodness, in other words. It's a day full of belief. And on a day like that, well, you should do a miracle for someone if the occasion arises. That was Jesus' attitude. He valued the Sabbath in all respects. What the Sabbath is, in that sense, I think, is the ability to take a break without making an escape. You can't necessarily escape from the bad things around you. Um, you can't necessarily escape from a built, uh, responsibilities that pop up, but you can take a break in the midst of them. And that's what the Sabbath is. It's a regular break. God commands us to take one weekly, at least weekly. <clears throat> Rest and peace and belief, independent of what's happening around you in the rest of your life. 
The Sabbath is rest in the midst of the chaos that surrounds you. It's, it's rest in the midst of normal hubbub or even crisis hubbub as the case may be. Uh, it's, it's rest in the midst of your unchanging schedule, your unchangingly intense schedule. And therefore your schedule of rest should probably be unchanging as well. Uh, the Sabbath is a practice of rest in the midst of the mess in your house that you haven't cleaned up yet. It's rest in the midst of the vast uncertainties facing you or your family. The Sabbath rest doesn't solve anything in your life. It's rest that you take even though things in life aren't solved, right? It's important to understand that. The Sabbath doesn't solve anything in your life, though it will often refresh you and empower you in order to find and perform solutions afterwards. Because if you don't rest, uh, you will eventually stumble. You know what fascinates me about God's commands to rest regularly? It's that God has to command us to rest regularly. You think if there was one thing that God wouldn't have to order us to do, it would be to take it easy, you know? Because like naturally lazy people. But I think lazy people by definition are not restful people. You're lazy because you don't rest properly and therefore you never have energy to do very much and it makes you lazy. Are you following me? That's how it works. Energy comes from, from, from rest and God knows that we suck at rest and if we don't rest well, we'll become lazy. And that's terrible. That's terrible because then we can't do the good things that are required of us in, in, in life. So that God would have to command us to rest regularly and properly once a week. It's just fascinating. It's a fascinating commentary on human nature. Uh, you would think that taking it easy would not require a non-negotiable order from God, but you'd be wrong. What it tells me is that rest requires faith. And if you live in fear or anxiety, then no matter how unoccupied you are, no matter how much free time you have in your life, no matter how ample your resources are, you'll never experience rest or its close cousin, peace. You certainly can't experience peace without faith. The ability to peace out is an ability, right? It's something that you have to develop and it only comes by faith. You might try it through counterfeit means. You might try it through escapism. People who don't rest by faith will often try to rest by escapism, by just quitting life or getting away from everything, uh, which can be a good thing from time to time, but you can't do it as a regular practice. Um, sometimes we try to escape life through enhancements like drugs, or more commonly in our culture, distractions. Distractions are our go-to substitute for rest and peace these days. And social media companies are getting rich off of it, aren't they? The reality is that when I approach my weekly Sabbath, I can never justify my Sabbath. I can never justify my Sabbath. Uh, because there are always critical things that I have to do, that I have left undone. You know what I mean? Uh, there are always to-dos on my list. Um, and some of them are significant. There are always assignments that I am leaving undone in life. Uh, there are always people who are dissatisfied, me at, dissatisfied with me at the moment. Um, I very rarely uh, approach my Sabbath without feeling that I'm letting someone down somehow. That's the nature of my life. Maybe some of you can, can relate. Therefore, the only way I take it is when God orders me to take it because I can't really feel my way into it. You know, I always have too much going on. I always feel too many obligations or too much pressure. And so I need that order from God. I need God to reach into my life and say, do it. I know what's good for you. And this will help eventually. You just don't see it right now. That's what faith gets you when you're tired. Ability to take a break no matter what. As well as the ability to do miracles when you can't take a break 
at this immediate moment. <clears throat> so what does faith get you when you're fatigued? What does a person of faith do during those seasons of multiple fatiguing challenges, or blinding tiredness? Never tell yourself that you can't keep going. That's one thing that faith gets you. Never tell yourself that you can't keep going because of course you can, even if you need to do the impossible. This is what Jesus models for us. You get to keep going no matter what. Even if you have to literally walk on water, you can do that. Even if you have to fight off a legion of demons, you can do that. You're not too tired. You're not because you have miracle working power at your disposal because of your faith. You can make something out of nothing when you need to. You know, you can provide a feast for thousands if you need to, no matter how tired you are. That's what faith gets you. And that's what Jesus models for us. So if you need to do that today, you can. You know, I'm here to tell you, you can do it. This has been one of the low points of my life. It's also been one of the most creative times of my life. I'm producing a lot right now. Um, in, in various ways. I'm not necessarily solving all my problems. You know, the miracle working power is still afoot. It's still afoot for you no matter how fatigued that you feel. Just don't forget that. That's what faith gets you. So never tell yourself that you can't keep going and never tell yourself that you can't take a break. Right? Occasionally things get in the way. But you can take that break, no matter how many things are mounting up, right? You can take that Sabbath because God orders you to take it, and you don't want to disobey Him. It's the law, stupid, even if you don't see the reason for it this week. Uh, so if you are a person of faith, you'll keep going, even if you have to walk on water, even if you have to perform miracles, even if you have to create something out of nothing. And if you're a personal faith, you'll take a big chunk of time every week and you will take a break. And during that break, you will choose to believe that everything is okay or soon will be because that's what faith gets you because that's what's good for you. And God knows it. He's a powerful and smart fellow. Father God, I pray that in the midst of our fatigue, in the midst of our long season of fatigue, in the midst of the manifold sources of our fatigue, that we would properly receive what proper faith gets us. I pray that even if we cannot solve all of our problems, we would nonetheless keep going and make progress creatively and wondrously as needs demand. I pray, Lord, that we would be an unstoppable people, even if we're a tired people. I pray that we would be a miraculous people, even if we are beset with trouble. I pray, Lord, that we would be a peaceful and free people, even if we don't have significant answers to every significant problem right now. I pray mostly, Lord, that we would be people of proper faith, strength, and health, no matter what. And Jesus, I thank you for giving us the proper model uh, I pray that you would give us the proper convictions to follow through on it, even if we don't do it perfectly, even if we're not feeling it today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey there, Blue Water family. Thanks again for joining us today for our Sunday service. I hope you felt encouraged by the start of our new sermon series, What Does Faith Get You When? And I am praying this week that you and I will walk in faith that God knows what we need, both rest and fruitful work. If you would like a great opportunity for some 
wonderful rest today, 9 to 11 a.m. at Kaimana Beach Park. That's where we're gonna have our Sunday fun day with Pastor Rolo, so join him there. If you have a prayer need, you'd like someone to come alongside and join with you in, please email julie at bluewatermission.org and let someone from our prayer team pray with you. All right, love you guys, God bless you, and thanks for being part of our family.